So as we've been working our way through the seven point mind training, the one thing I just really want to comment on is this text really contains the whole path. I was sitting here reflecting on the idea of uh, someone I was chatting with earlier today, someone who's been a student for a long time, and uh, yeah, he's read a lot of books and he finished it. And he goes, uh, so now I'm done with that. You know, what, what should I read next? So why don't you read that one again? <laughs> And he laughed, he laughed. He called me up today laughing. Because he was just so overjoyed to, to reflect upon, having read the text, can I tell you what's in it? Can I actually do what, what, what's in here? You know, if there's seven points, can I name at least the seven points? I've read a book. There's some good stuff in there. Talked about it. Did a little bit. You know, what's the next book? So he called me up today just giggling because he's, he's still at the introduction again the next time. <laughs> he's going, I'm going to know this book. And I say that not lightly because because uh, he really is someone who's transforming his life, who's really embodying this. But oftentimes, Dharma practice becomes this thing I do sometimes. I show up to something sometimes. I read a book sometimes. And then I engage in samsara, worldly life. And there's this undercurrent that's just all too often undermining the very progress that I'm hoping to find. You know, the peace, the serenity, the awakening, the opportunity to not suffer anymore. If we remembered a while back, we what's the measure of doing this? You know, there's, there's some criteria here. What's the measure? Is this working? It's, if it's not working, why are we doing it? And is it that helpful? So there's a measurement. And fundamentally, one of the key things to notice is, am I happier? Is there less stress? Is there less worry? Do I, is there less self-cherishing, the real source of problem? I mean, fundamentally, that's the progress. Is there less self-grasping and ego and attachment? than there was before because we'll notice a very direct proportional thing <laughs> says I'm going to be a whole lot happier the less I'm all wrapped up in me and mine and how I exist so so in this text there's these practices that invite us to explore that truth you know which is that true number one and and by exploring this and, and saying well I can see the source of my suffering has a lot to do with my desires, my impulses, my sense of self, my projection on others. And in living in a world that doesn't fundamentally exist, you know, the way that we engage in a world is just not very accurate. So can I learn to live here more accurately in a way that's more meaningful, in a way that eliminates a lot of my mental afflictions and suffering that actually can provide a path to awakening, to freedom, to no more suffering. Can I do that? Is this the path for that? And so the first part of this is preliminary practices. It's really just coming back down to those fundamentals. I have this rare and precious life right now. I have all these conditions and opportunities. It's pretty rare to have. I'm not going to have it for long. Just not going to have it for long. So if I don't know that I'm going to have this life long and it's rare and precious, well, it's going to be important to know what am I doing with my life? You know, what's the karmic imprints that I'm doing? What are the habits and tendencies that I water? And are they helpful or are they not helpful? But that's not normally what most human beings are doing <laughs> is waking up every day. And remembering, you know, here's this, this life I have in a day that won't come again, ever. And asking that question, knowing that I don't know that I'll be around, what's really uh, meaningful and what are the qualities I want to cultivate and what are the qualities, the habits I'm already cultivating that are actually undermining the way I want to live life or that actually are counterproductive to a mind of awakening. 
And the, the you know, so those are just normal, I would say, healthy ways of engaging in the world. It's just to start to recognize that. So I have this rare life. I don't know how long I'll have it. I have a lot of habits and tendencies that aren't very healthy, and I've got some that are really healthy and meaningful. But I often don't spend much time noticing them. I just kind of go throughout my day, and sometimes I get angry, and sometimes I get happy, and sometimes things go my way, and other times I get frustrated, and sometimes I get anxious, and I engage in a lot of habits and conditioning that just the way I am, that's who I am. And it's just kind of a cycle. And I might even be inspired to do something different. Uh, I'm going to be different. Tomorrow, it's all going to change. I got, I got a plan. Got that routine laid out. <sighs> Checklist. And, uh, and then that checklist fades away. And Marvel goes back in the groove. And then it's Tuesday again. And a week goes by, a month goes by, you know, oh, right, you know, what's, what's important, and so this is just a cycle, I think, that human beings can, can be in, so that brings us to that fourth thought, the preliminary practice, is really examining the nature of samsara, the existence that we live in, the environments that we find ourselves in, and recognize or see if you can recognize, see if you can identify very clearly that the very nature of the way that we live is imbued with unsatisfaction and suffering. There's, there's literally nothing that I engage in worldly that's going to provide me any real lasting happiness or freedom. And it's one thing to say that. It also sounds kind of pessimistic. A lot of people think, yeah, those Buddhists, man, they just think everything's suffering. Who wants to hang out with those people, man? You just see a bunch of Buddhists at a party sitting around suffering. Yeah, man, did you, yeah, let me tell you about my suffering. You think that's suffering? Let me tell you about this. <laughs> but it's actually quite the opposite because once we recognize the insane way that we're seeking happiness that has no relationship to how things are, you're a lot happier because <laughs> you, you're, you're not caught up in a cycle of grasping and seeking in ways that don't relate to reality or who you are or how the world operates. And so this fourth point is really important because unless we start to recognize the inherent suffering that is incurred simply by being a self-centered person who's looking to get my life together and do the things I like and have me and mine taken care of. If I start focusing on that, it's inherently going to be suffering. And there's going to be a lot of grasping and habits and tendencies that are going to create more suffering in my life. I'm going to be pretty upset when things don't go my way. And I'm going to have a very distorted way of looking at the world. Thinking that actually this world ought to be the way I would like it to be. And guess what? It's not sometimes. And I get frustrated. So, you know, just, um, I want to bring this into a context because my friend, in chatting with him today, he's going back to the introduction, he's going back to these fundamental basics, because this is the foundation of, are we going to change our lives? Are we going to radically change our lives? Are we going to eliminate mental afflictions? Are we going to find uh, freedom for ourselves and others? Are we going to uh, be on a path that actually eliminates all mental afflictions? And if not, why not? Why not? It does not have to be something that's far away. That's for those people. <laughs> so I remember sitting in a Buddhist center, teacher, and I just thinking, wow, there's no way I'm ever going to get there, you know. <laughs> but I just want to be a better person, you know. I just want to work on being a better human being. But the idea that it's this far away thing, 
And it doesn't have to feel like this far away thing. If we can take some time and reflect upon, you know, what's the real source of my suffering? Real source of my suffering. Is it the world I live in? Or is it how I relate to it? And if I can start to identify as we, we uh, recognize that I've actually been playing a game I can't win in a world that doesn't exist. Trying to get lucky a lot <laughs> so I can be happy. So I can get the right job, so people, you know, will appreciate me, so that, uh, you know, the road won't close when I need to go down that road, that, you know, just all these things, and we're coming up on the holidays, right, and holidays become this time of, you know, expectations, and how families ought to be, and how life ought to be, and, and, uh, there's a lot of suffering that goes on there. And how much of that, if we were to step out of our habitual way of engaging the world, how many times do we know or have we learned in our lives that the holidays, what's the real purpose of a holiday? You know, Thanksgiving, what's the real purpose of a Thanksgiving? I'm not talking about the historical meaning. But let's say it's of gratitude and of appreciation. You know, does that get lost when I'm worried about who's coming and who's not coming and you know how it ought to be and what are we going to do with Thanksgiving and what if you know the expectations that we pile on things? You know, we forget often that. You know, let's say I just want Thanksgiving as a time to to be with people and honor with gratitude and share a meal and. Uh, there's a lot less stress there. But we'll pile on how we would like the world to be and how things ought to be. And some some of us don't have a place to go. Right? And then, you know, there's, there's suffering there too. So as we head into this, this we're at this, this juncture of this text that's providing us some tools, some habits of engaging the world that are like medicine for these mental afflictions. I'm just going back to basics because if my practice becomes something that I do once in a while or talk about once in a while, then I spend about this much time on Dharma and the rest of the week I'm caught up in thinking about what I need, what I want, what, how I'd like life. It's pretty big. And every now and then I come and I take a little time and I think, wow. You know, here's, here's a practice to alleviate all of this. But right now I'm just way too busy creating suffering in my life to take any time to fit in the thing that will eliminate all my suffering. Right? I am just way too busy creating stress, worry, and fear. I've, my, my schedule is full creating that to make some time to eliminate that. <laughs> okay. And it's a trap. It's a trap that we easily get engaged in. And it's unnecessary. If we can start recognizing that there are some simple things that we can do, and if I start to recognize that how I'm engaging the world, is it creating more stress, worry, and fear in my life? Or am I engaging in ways more skillfully than eliminating it? So there's a measurement. There's a measurement that takes place. Is there a time that I'm ever angry, stressed, scared, uh, you know, resentful, frustrated, uh, that isn't primarily focused on what I want or how I think things should be? We should explore these things, you know, self-cherishing. So the, the fundamental principle of mind training is, it, the measurement is, is there less self-cherishing? And if there is less self-cherishing, there's less suffering. Now self-cherishing has nothing to do with feeling good about who you are or how you show up because the self-cherishing that we're cherishing is something that is afflicted and doesn't exist. It is not who I am. I'm self-cherishing something that doesn't actually 
define who I am. I'm cherishing habits and tendencies and impulses and desires that I've been carrying around for a long time. I'm not cherishing the interconnected opportunity of the essence of life that actually exists, the day-to-day -day opportunities that is labeled John that shows up every day interdependent with the world that I'm living in. I'm cherishing my attachments. <laughs> I'm cherishing my resentments. I'm cherishing my fears. I'm cherishing these things. So when we're talking about self-cherishing, we're not talking about a sense that I don't have to have self-respect or feel good about how I'm showing up in the world because that is much more connected to my true nature, my Buddha nature which is pure. When I get my mental afflicted states out of the way, <laughs> this Buddha nature is present. And what's blocking that is me clinging to <laughs> all of my suffering in mentally afflicted states. So that's the self-cherishing. It's the self that's not actually who I am. It's something I drag with me every day. And I put it on. And, uh, and even when I take it off, it just shows up sometimes real quick. What about me? So it's in that context that these practices are engaged. You know, it allows us, what if, what if I recognize that I am just one among many? What if I just recognize that? I'm not the center of the universe. What if I recognize there's like seven billion other human beings? What if I recognize there's lots of uh, animals and uh, there's nature out there, there's a big universe. Uh, anyone's ever looked at the galaxies, there's this big thing. And on that big thing, there's this little speck thing, you know, that, that's showing up. There's a little, little beat, you know, it might be me, John, part of all of this. How radically different would my life be if, if I started to recognize that everything that I get to do and everything I get to participate in is interdependently originated with, with everyone else and all the things that are going on. That I'm not the center of the universe, but a valuable part of it. And that how I arise in any given moment is dependent upon who I'm talking to. Whether I got sleep last night, where did I get to sleep? How was I fed? Where'd that food come from? You know, what would my life be like if I started to realize that everything I have in my life is dependent upon others? And that this is a relationship that takes place and my perception of it is always dependent upon who I'm talking to, where I am in that moment. It's limited by the experiences I've had, the attitudes I bring to it. And I'm a part of this thing that we call life, not the center of it. What if every time I engaged in an activity, I thought, well, what would be the most helpful thing to do for all of us? Instead of, you know, what's going to make me happy? How would that be different? How would that be different? Would there be less suffering? I was at a prison last night. I got to go visit two prisons last night and talk to the guys there. They were pretty fired up. And uh, captive audience, that's the joke everybody says. They were captive audience. <laughs> and, uh, but they, you know, they're on fire. They, you know, they, I ask, you know, it's, uh, you know, what's the difference between uh, adversity and an op, you know, or a good day and a bad day? They said, it's your perspective. And they shot it back. What about adversity? You know, so that could be opportunity. Here's these people, you know, and they're they're looking at, and they're there thinking about, and we talked about, it. yeah, they have time to study, read, learn, build themselves up, cultivate things, or they could waste that time. But there's an opportunity for them. And the mind that says, poor me, or the mind that says, you know what, I've got two years, or three years, or five years, or ten, I went to do, one, one unit, they're, they're short term, they're going to get out within a couple of years, it was longer. 
is that while I'm here, I can be here in a way that is going to prepare me for the life I want to live. And the other one could be just, you know, I want mine, <laughs> and I'm going to survive, and I'm going to, you know, do the things I need to do. When we're caught up in our part of the world, we actually have problems that seem very big. Like the road's blocked and I have to drive an hour out of my way and I have an appointment. We contrast that with somebody who has to walk eight miles to school every day. Or someone who's locked up and isn't going to be out, you know, for a while. None of those things are in my consciousness when I'm the center of the universe. And things are inconvenient. And we can get frustrated. We get frustrated sometimes very simple things. I mean, how many times have you gotten frustrated just because that vacuum wouldn't get that one little thing up? You know? And you're like, five, six times, and then finally you break down and bend over and get it. And like, ah! I actually had to bend over and pick that thing up. It's horrible. It's, I'd say this vacuum sucks, but apparently it doesn't. Right? But we can do that. It's a stupid vacuum. And I can be frustrated. But you see how such a, a minute thing can become like, whoa, what a frustrating thing. And we all have that in these things that, that don't work or just don't go right. And so this idea of mind training is really to keep bringing our mind back to reality and perspective. Reality and perspective. Do I really think that a vacuum that sucks really good is going to give me lasting happiness? Do I think that that relationship, that person, that thing, you know, all that is going to? Or is uh, how I relate to these things going to be much more important? Can I relate to them in a way that actually every event, is there an event in my life that happens? Is there any event in my life that happens that does not offer me the opportunity to develop my path? The answer is no. There's nothing that happens that doesn't allow me to improve. And that's also what we talked about at the prison last night. There's nothing. There's nothing that's happening that doesn't allow them to improve. So, you know, they're flipping the, the you know, we talked about taking adversity and changing its opportunity. So everything that's happening is an opportunity to improve. Everything that's happening. Difficult things. People are passing away. People have accidents and and this is the nature of samsara. And so that fourth thought that really braces us for an opportunity to engage in a path of no more suffering is to understand the very nature of samsara, which is rife with suffering and tragedy and hardship. It's also filled with joy and kindness and care. But somehow our minds will lock into the idea that I get that there's suffering and I get that there's traumas and I get there, there's those things but they should not happen to me right. I'll pray for you when it's your issue but when it happens to me well then it's a problem so you can see how this self cherishing self grasping plays into how things are and, and we forget we lose perspective and we forget that we're just a part of this thing this, this intricate thing of life I mean you know, I get just shocked sometimes when I get on a highway and I think about how many other people are on that highway <laughs> and how many other lives, you know, are behind those wheels and where are they going and how are those people connected. And if I got on a highway five minutes earlier, you know, would this accident or that thing have happened? Or who knows how all those things are, whether or not, you know, somebody's in a hurry to make it to work or somebody's trying to get somebody to a hospital and all these lives that take place. And all too often I can just be in my car thinking about where I have to go and forget that I'm on the road sharing it with a bunch of other people who have families and lives and places to be. And we're a part of all of that. And we're navigating highways, especially in New York or California, man. We're all kind of navigating with each other and hopefully getting somewhere safe. Well, if we don't bring this to mind, 
on purpose. It generally doesn't come up. The mind generally will just go right to, hey, what's John want? And then as I interact with people, I'll start labeling them. Those are people I like. Those are people I don't like. They're kind of idiots over there. That guy's kind of funny. I like that one. Whew. Not them. Oh, they're going to show up today. And I just start, you know, divvying up the world based on how you treat me, whether or not you think the way I think or you don't think the way I think. And, and there just becomes this whole thing about me and mine, you and yours, people I like, people I don't like, events that I find enjoyable, those I find difficult. And, and then they become real. And I start participating in a world where how I label you affects how I get to have any inner peace or quality in my life. And I think that you're the cause of my suffering or my joy. Which is pretty delusional. So we covered this idea of deceptive appearances that the deceptive appearances that arise and start to realize that my whole interaction with others, with phenomena, with the life I engage in, I have a huge part to play in that. How am I perceiving it? Am I, what kind of attitude am I bringing to it? And recognizing that how people appear to me has a lot to do with the karmic imprints and the conditioning that I've created in my own life. And I can only see people through my little lens of experience. And so in order to fight that habit, we really need to make the time to start to realize that and make a, a personal commitment. Well, let's, let's check out and see, can I start living in reality more often? And if I can start living reality more often, will my life get better in terms of inner peace and well-being? And then you got some tools to measure things by. So that's the trajectory. And I'm covering it because we're getting to these points here where they're just giving you some really nice little pointers. But without the context of, you know, how do these pointers eliminate suffering in my life? That's really what they're about. Because they're going to cut through a delusional way of thinking that puts me as the center of my own universe and, uh, and a self-cherishing grasping that rather than looking out for my own best interest, it's actually creating all the mental and emotional suffering in my life. That was a brief introduction. <laughs> So we, we've gone through these, these points. First one's preliminary. I just kind of reviewed those, those preliminary practices. Then the main practice is cultivating the two bodhicittas. And, and that's really, that's the goal, is that we see the world as it is, that with the mind of awakening itself, the ultimate bodhicitta, this, this recognized emptiness that, that we're, that is the phenomenon world that we live in. The relative bodhicitta, these practices of, uh, of cutting right through our self cherishing attitude. And point three is transforming adversity to the path so that everything that I engage with is an opportunity to cultivate the path to enlightenment. Point four is the synthesis of practice for a single lifetime of five powers. Right? Then, uh, Five was how do we measure our practice and now we're in the sixth and these are these pledges so the practice has already been given and now these are these pledges this way of living in the world that's really going to be supportive of accomplishing everything and so last week we touched upon them and we started with the three principles and uh, but now we're getting into, these are often referred to as slogans. It's handy to have slogans. A lot of programs have slogans, things you can remember and you can call upon. Now there's a lot of them and the idea is not that I'm going to just try to remember 20 things all at once. The idea is that, yeah, we go through them, we understand them. But that each, the way I learned was that 
I would make a list and I would check in. I would, you know, this is what I'm doing today, and I would check in on it a few times, and I would cycle through them, so that that way, you know, there's some some uh, sense of what they are. But we left off on one uh, the other day, and, and some of it you, you may recall, like you know, not to speak badly of others and their qualities, and, and then we thought, think nothing about the other side. Think nothing about the other side. That's I, I think we covered that briefly, but there's just a piece of it I want to make sure that we we get. To the, there's a good analogy. Think nothing about the other side. So, when we're looking at other people, you know, we're going to label them. You know, try try to not label somebody. There's going to be some qualities that show up in that person. You know, they're this way, they're that way, and, and we're going to stick some qualities on them. Uh, and we're often going to find fault. And I think the reason I want to talk about this is because I was speaking with some people, uh, you know, have been long-time practitioners. Uh, but it doesn't matter. We label people. We label them by their political group. We label them by their religious affiliation. We label them in all these variety of ways. You know, you know Italians, they're like this. Irish people, ah, they're like that. You know, uh, you know the Baptist, boy, you know. And, and you know, we, there's a word, there's a label, and then whoop, there's a box. There's a box that goes on. And then, you know, imagine people from different political views as yours or even the ones that you kind of like but they're like that and as soon as we put that label on this whole we fill in a picture and this is what you know these kinds of people are like and then you know pretty easily we could that's who they are that's what they're like and and, uh, and if they're of the other political faction well clearly they're idiots right because they don't think the way I think and, and we just, we, we do this thing. And so, and then we can have these animosity that takes place over, over a label. But in truth, those perceived differences, how much of that is who they are? And how much of who they are do they have in common with me? So if this person of another, I'm, I'm on the political party thing for a minute, has that label. Well, I imagine if they're born in the United States where I was born and raised in the United States, I'll bet you about 80% of who they are is a lot like me. They may have had a public education like me. They, they may have liked some of the sports that I like. They may have... Led some of the music I like. They, I mean, when you go down, they, you know, we might listen to the same music. We might, you know, we want our kids to have a good education. You know, we might like some of the same desserts. You know, when you really go down there, most human beings that we're talking about in our culture, we're going to have a bandwidth of common likes and interests and values. As a matter of fact, you're, it's going to be pretty hard to find people who don't share similar values. Right? I mean, who doesn't really value having a, a dependable friend? I mean, that's a pretty common value. So you start looking at these people that we've labeled and they're like that. <laughs> but if I start seeing the whole bandwidth of how much they're like me. And we have 90% in common or 95, but they got that 5%. Oh my God, I could tolerate that person, you know. And I hate them because of this five percent. Not the 95. But I won't even eat apple pie with them. Because they don't deserve it. It's my apple pie. So this happens, right? We, based on this small aspect of a person, who did something we didn't like or has a view we don't need. And, and their view, their upbringing, their way of being in the world is the result of what? How they were raised, the experiences they've had, and 
you know, the cultural environment that they're produced in. And it's also a result of the traumas they've had to deal with, the struggles they've had. And what their view is, is coming from their personal experience, just like my view is coming from my personal experience. But I don't know all their troubles and struggles. I only know my experience and my experience with someone who maybe had a view like this person once. And they become this thing. So this, this thing about think nothing about the other side is to try to avoid filling in <laughs> all those characteristics about this person when I actually have no, I can't read their mind. I don't know what their intention is. And I certainly don't know their experience of life. And these uh, traits that I'll put on people well, let's not do that. Let's just take it as another human being and, and let's work with how they demonstrate something. Because somebody can do something very nice and we can think, well, they're just doing that to have people acknowledge them. Yeah. I mean, we, how often do we do that? Why is somebody doing something? We get their motive. Why do they look at me like that? You know, that thing. Or, so this point is to stop really judging or evaluating things that we really can't attribute to someone. It doesn't say don't hold people accountable. It's just saying don't go to the other side. So, and it's saying that uh, often how we're perceiving people, is there a way to perceive people that is not a direct reflection of our own experience? And, and you know, the working theory there is no. Like, I can't, unless I've had these experiences in my life or I have knowledge of them, I can't really see those qualities in other people because I don't even know what they are. But if I've had some experience with greed, if I've had some experience with, uh, you know, ill will, if I've had some experience with these things, well, then, you know, I can start attributing that to other people. But there's my own struggles with those things. And so it's going to have an influence on how I perceive others. So here's where he's saying, he said, when I draw conclusions about other people's minds, this is not <coughs> an objective way of being. We make judgments on the basis of our experience with other people, but this experience includes no direct perception of their mental processes. The only mental processes that I perceive are my own. And the only context in which I can see the relationship between mental processes and their expressions and speech or action is again exclusively my own. In other words, I only know my own inner domain. I, I can't read your mind. And I'm only going to be able to relate to how you look and work with me through my own experience. But I really don't know what's going on in there. Thus, my own experience largely determines how I interpret others' actions. If I'm a miserly person, I know when I give something that I am expecting at least gratitude, if not a more tangible kickback. Transactional relationship. Likewise, I assume that Jack gives Mary a notebook hoping that she'll give him a pen. Now, that was a, there's an analogy earlier on, but it's like, yeah, hey, you know, I'm going to give you this. I know you got something. If I simply do not care about my possessions, I assume that Jack also gives a notebook away casually because he doesn't need it. So this is, so if I'm observing something giving, I'm going to evaluate that giving based on my own experience. You know, I give away a notebook. It's no big deal. They give it. But I don't know if it's his only notebook. I don't know if he's expecting something. But in other words, what he's saying is that when somebody gives something, I'm going to see that gift or how that action is only through my own experience and a lot of my own personal way of, of relationship with it. If I'm a generous person concerned about the welfare of others, when I see Mary needs a notebook, 
And this must be Jack's motivation, that he really wants to help her. So if I see someone being generous, you can see where I can see, well, he really wants something. <laughs> you know, Or he's being generous. And I'm reading all that in, and I don't really know, right? But my relationship with how I give is going to color how I see that, or my experience with that person. So the point that uh, he tries to make is that often these labels that we stick on people, uh, firstly, rarely have any basis in actual how things are. And then we think that that's how it is. So his, his analogy is like, I've got some dirt and I throw it on you and I go, man, you're really dirty. <laughs> that person's really dirty. And it's not to say that people don't do some harmful things and that they should be accountable. We want to eliminate all the projection that goes on there. So that's the side. And, and I just, I'm bringing it up, I think, a little heavier just because right now in this time, you know, there's a lot of divisiveness. And, and in this time, there's a lot of these labels that we stick on people. And we forget that there are other human beings just like us. And that 95% of probably what they do, they, they're similar to us. They might even get dressed the same way I do. I don't know. But... And how I start labeling them has a lot to do with my own personal experience. It has to. It has to. So if I recognize that, I can start to stop filling in the picture and start experiencing the people in my life as more accurately as possible, with as less elaboration as possible. Well, here's a human being, and they're dressed like me, and so and so, and they're And so I, I, I focus more on our interaction without trying to read their minds, their motivations, their uh, mental qualities, whether they're an idiot or, <laughs> or this or that. And just here's another human being who's showing up and let me interact with them in the healthiest way as possible, hoping for the best of us. And that's going to eliminate a lot of suffering. You know what it's like to sit in a chair for an hour next to someone you don't like, right? I mean, just the thought of it, even if you haven't had to do it. Okay, here's so-and-so. They're going to sit right next to you. And we're going to be here for an hour. Or a long car ride with, who's in my car? Oh, my. You just, you know, the frustration comes up. And so if we really cut to the root of that, what we're going to find is that frustration, that thing is really coming from that process of attributing a lot of qualities to a person that really don't exist anywhere but my mind. So that's what they're saying when we, we, we uh, you know, stay away from the other side. Pay no attention to the other side. Oh, I took my, let's see, marker out. Because I was going to get to at least one more here. It can happen. I have faith. There we go. So think nothing about the other side. And the next one, wow, that's quite a commentary, it is one of my personal favorites. It's abandoned all hope for results. It's a very inspiring one. But it's a very common trap. So abandon all hope for results. And uh, hope and anxiety, they go hand in hand. So what happens is we get engaged in our practice is we start, you know, uh, you know, we get expectations. Well, boy, I'm going to be a good meditator. You know, oh, I'm going to be really compassionate. I'm going to be, you know, and... I'm going to achieve this level or I'm going to, you know, progress at this rate. You know, we start setting time frames, we get markers and uh, and it's really self-defeating. It actually creates a lot of a lot of blocks, a lot of suffering and it, it's one of the big barriers between making any progress. Is what we want to do is abandon the hope. Let go 
of how things are going to turn out. And, uh, and focus on the practice itself, doing that as well as I can. So the analogy being, yeah, let's say I want to be a concert pianist and play at Carnegie Hall. What's well, a nice aspiration? In order to do that, what do I need to do? I need to practice. But if I'm going to judge and, and, and everything here about whether I'm going to make it to Carnegie Hall, well, I'm going to have a lot of stress and pressure if I'm not going to make it, if I hit the keys too wrong, or this practice doesn't go well. And now I'm really inhibited as opposed to I'd like to be a pianist and play at Carnegie Hall in order to do that. You know, I'll need to practice. In order to practice, I'll need to get better at things. I'll need to be relaxed. I'll need to follow the directions. I'll need to really engage in this in the best way. And if I make it to Carnegie Hall, that'd be a cool thing. But I won't get there if I'm stressed and anxious and worried and that driving me. So here it's really saying let's let go of, of hope in that sense. It's not saying that you don't have the aspiration you know, in our case, to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. But that's my journey. Uh, but when we start putting time frames and measurements, and uh, when we do meditation instruction, you know, they always say, abandon all hope and fear. You know, hope and anxiety. And people will judge their meditation by how busy their mind is, rather than did they follow the directions. Let's follow the directions. And we'll see how things work out over time. So he says here that, uh, well, again, he's just going to point out a bunch of things I'm saying. That there's even a tendency that we might develop uh, a sense of excitement about our practice. We might be getting good at it. I get good at meditating. <sighs> And, and then then I start thinking, well, okay, where am I? What level shamatha am I at? And, and I get caught up in that. And as soon as that happens, whew, there's a lot of mental afflictions and, and uh, these, these states that will just come in and actually block you from, from making uh, progress. So Alan tells a lot of his stories about how he was just going to go and for, you know, just night, just knuckle it and just meditate and achieve shamatha. He nearly killed himself doing that. So the idea is abandon the hope. Just follow the directions. Abandon the follow the directions. And then abandon poisonous food. <laughs> and they're not talking about donuts. Thank God. Uh, <laughs> abandoned poisonous food. Abandoned poisonous food is uh, the poisonous food is my own self cherishing. That just phew, taints everything. So in my practice, are my practices lead me to start thinking more about myself, or I'm a better practitioner, or is they? They grasp me in some sense of an ego and, and uh, look at me and, uh, and we'll see it. You know, so we talked about it last week was this idea of uh, you don't change. You, know, you, you don't really change. You change inwardly, but you, don't change. you remain the same. So the mind of awakening arises, but my outward way of being in the world really doesn't change. There's really, you know, just a guy walking down the street, nothing, no big deal. And... If we start grasping on to, you know, a lot of times I'll talk about, uh, uh, you know, just becoming really proud of my practice or that, you know, I'm a Buddhist or, you know, I got the, the coolest malas, you know, and start flashing those around and uh, start telling people, you know, man, you know, how many times I, you know how many mantras I do in a day. You know, I know how that practice, you know, let me tell you about my uh, empowerments. You know how many empowerments I, you know, I went to that thing. And this idea is that my spiritual practice is not to develop my ego. <laughs> it's to eliminate it. Right? It's to eliminate it. So the poisonous food, it arises a lot. It arises a lot around, uh, 
you know, it can arise a lot around my spiritual practice. It can arise around the teachers I have. It can arise around, you know, what trainings I've had. It can, uh, and so if my practice is coupled with this, this idea of what a great, you know, Dharma student I am or what a great whatever I am, it's poison. You know, this practice is, is actually infused with poison. It's not, it's not going to develop. It's actually antithetical to the actual practice, which is to lessen that grip. So avoid, avoiding poisonous food is uh, avoiding that opportunity, that self-cherishing or ego or this sense of junk just keeps creeping into my practices. You know, let me tell you my practice. And let me show you how, how much I know about whatever, you know. Uh, rather than, you know, what is it I could share with you that would be helpful? What would be helpful? That would be a different way of doing that. And are my practices uh, ones that really help me let go of being the center of the universe and a part of it? You know, is that helpful? So let's abandon the poisonous food. And that's about the time. So we got two new ones in. At this rate, we will finish sometime next year, maybe. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I really felt that there's time as we engage in these practices that we really want to keep coming back to the main point. The main point is to start living more accurately, lessening the hold on myself and how I think the world should be according to John and start engaging with the world as it is and maybe become a valuable part of it maybe become a valuable part of it so instead of me and mine how about we and ours you know how can we uh, do well and watch how those labels appear you know that, that show up in people because we all have those people and as soon as we see them and, uh, and then we uh, we hate people we've never met right and if you listen to the news I bet there'll be some people pop up there and you go man I hate that person <laughs> never met them never met them yeah so let's see if we can avoid that and just go you know there's others out there maybe doing some pretty unskillful things. Uh, trying to find their way just like me. And, you know, what's the healthiest way for me to interact with them rather than hating them? Might be more helpful. All right, hey. so let's do our dedication. Let us dedicate the merit and wisdom that we have accumulated both individually and collectively, today and throughout our lifetimes. We dedicate this for the benefit of all sentient beings. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and find lasting happiness. And may we be able to use the merit, wisdom accumulated here today and through our lifetimes to purify our own minds, to rid ourselves of these mentally afflicted states, to achieve the mind of awakening, for a true liber liberation for all sentient beings. All right, thank you all so much uh, for showing up. Thanks for joining us online. Thanks for your voice. And uh, yeah, let's uh, let's bring this mind training into our days and see how we can. Make those interactions healthier, skillful, and beneficial. Yeah. I don't think we win anybody over by hating them. But we have some room to win people over by examining their fears, their insecurities, and what we have in common. You know, and let's be some good examples. I think it's really needed right now. So that was the underpinnings of what I was hoping to get out there today need to let others know we value them and, uh, and that we all really want to 
plan the same goals.